Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're calling or joining us from today. This is Jim McKeith, and welcome to this introduction to Docker. Practical introduction to Docker. Joining me today is Malcolm Groves. Hey, Jim. How are you, mate? Good. Hi, everybody. So, this is, I'm pretty excited about this. I was in Australia for the Australia Develop Delphi Users Group, and Malcolm presented this session on a practical introduction to Docker, which I was really excited about Docker, and I'd seen some bits and pieces of and heard about it, and everybody's, I knew everybody else was excited about it, but I didn't completely understand it. And then Malcolm presented this session, and I was like, ah, oh, this is amazing. And now 10.3.3 has Docker support, and I was like, Malcolm, you want to reprise your presentation? And luckily, you said yes. Yeah, well, uh, but you didn't quite. Uh, <laughs> you, you, I don't think any of us quite uh, were ready for for the fact that it was two hours. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't remember. It's what when you're in person, it always goes quicker. So yeah, it ended up being two hours long, and we do have uh, some additional follow up videos that are more into the uh, RAD server specifics as well. So uh, this one will be the practical introduction to Docker in general, and then there'll be some additional videos you'll get links as well uh yeah there's no no uh, no video yet sorry i haven't started the video so uh there'll be some additional videos when you'll get once you get the email for the replay you'll also get links for the other videos that will cover uh, bad server specifics so this is like a huge mortgage bore of Do mortgage mortgage i can't say it this morning mortgage board of <laughs> docker related content i think we know what you mean okay, yeah so good. i mean what I've tried, just so everyone knows what they're getting into here, um, what I've tried to do is is really go down to to you know to core Docker, like forget all the the, the shiny stuff that that uh, that that gets a lot of the attention, but really start from basics and go through and and so by the end of it, hopefully, if you can stick with the two hours or, or dip back in with the replay later hopefully by the end of it you really actually understand docker from its from its core pieces and then once you do that you can the rest of it you can you know you can pick up as you go but i think the what i've tried to do the bits that i cover in here are i think the the half dozen sort of essential pieces you need to understand before you can be productive with it and and i i do know from experience that it's later on in the session where you're like, wait, are we gonna talk about Delphi? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, at one stage, I thought I wasn't gonna do a Delphi demo at all. And then I thought that that's actually a bit rough uh, to get, <laughs> because Docker is totally usable with Delphi, but it's not specific to Delphi. So I, I kind of originally got to the end of the session and thought, well, I better at least put something in so that it, it proves the point that you can use it with Delphi. But it's interesting that the, the feedback I got from the ADUG sessions, one, some of the feedback I got from the Delphi user group sessions was that uh, the, the Delphi demo at the end was kind of almost an anticlimax because it did just show the point that, oh, yeah, it's not actually, it's fine. Delphi is the same as everything else. You can just, you know, do Docker works with it the same way it works with everything else. Yep. And yes, there is no video yet. Um, for everybody that's asking about that, they, we will be starting that right now. So uh, sit back, enjoy two hours on the uh, practical introduction to Docker, not just for web developers. Join you in two hours for Q&A. In today's webinar, um, I want to do a practical introduction to Docker. Um, this will have a little bit about Delphi and Rad Studio towards the end, but predominantly it's about Docker in general. So even if you're not actually a Rad Studio developer or a Delphi developer, the main focus of this is about Docker and a sort of an introduction to it, but trying to be very practical right from the very start. Originally, I considered uh, giving this uh, application, this webinar, a different name. Um, because this is a really common uh, response I hear from people that uh, you know, Docker is for Docker and containers are for web developers or people doing um, large scalable systems, something like that. Um, you know, I'm a Windows client server developer. What do I need Docker for? Yeah. So 
This is actually what I want to disprove in this session. My uh, actual goal that I'll talk about in a second, but really what I want to come away from this session, what you to come away from this session with, is, is all of you having found something that you can use Docker for, regardless of what type of applications you build. Yeah? Um, even if you are building a Delphi 2 Windows client server application, my, I'm determined to find something that you can get some benefit out of Docker from. Yeah? Um, before we get going, uh, that's me, that's my uh, email address there. Um, I work for a company called Code Partners. Um, we are Embarcadero's master reseller in Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia. Um, but in addition, we also focus on a bunch of other related tools across the development and the DevOps lifecycle. Yeah. Um, and we do everything from product sales through to training and consulting and right through to project work. Yeah. So we do do uh, Delphi projects for people. We do other projects for people. We do help them with their DevOps efforts around uh, their continuous delivery or their testing and those sorts of things. Yeah. Okay, that's enough about me. So like I said, my goals today, I want you all to understand what Docker is because it gets talked about a lot, but unless you've actually played with it or, or spent any time on it, it can be a bit confusing uh, about what this Docker and what all these containers is about. Um, more importantly, I want you to understand how to use it. Um, that's why I'm gonna be really practical in this, in this session. Um, and like I said, I want you to walk away from this session having identified at least one place that it can help you. Yeah. Um, even if all you're building are Windows client server desktop applications. Yeah. So that's my goal. Um, I'm going to focus at the beginning of the presentation very much on using Docker in the development cycle not necessarily in deployment. Towards the end, I'm going to talk about a bunch of benefits you can get from Docker in deployment. Uh, and there are a heap, but that's kind of, I think, art comes after. First part is about understanding it and starting to play with it and getting comfortable with it. And often that the best place to do that is during the development cycle, yeah, rather than launching into production. So first up, what, what's Docker? Yeah. So here's the official uh, definition, or reasonably official definition. Um, Docker is a tool designed to make it easier to create, deploy, and run applications by using containers. Yeah. So that, I think, actually doesn't tell you that much. Yeah. That's fine, but it assumes that you know what a container is. Yeah. So let's talk about that. What's a container? So a container allows a developer to package up an application and all of its parts uh, that it depends on. Yeah, so libraries, other dependencies, configuration files, whatever it is. Yep, so all of the bits, not just your binary, but everything else. So even if you're building a client server application, it's possible that you've got your XE, maybe some DLLs or, or packages and those sorts of things that you also need, but you might also need um, configuration files, you know, any files. Uh, you might also need a directory with a bunch of images in it and, and that sort of thing. Um, you might also have a dependency on an actual database. So the database server uh, and, and the database files. Yeah? So one scenario could be that you put all of that, including the database server, in a single container. Yeah? You don't have to, but in theory you could. And in practice you could if you wanted to. Yeah? Um, and so once you've packaged this all up in this container, you can ship it all out in one go. Yeah, so that's the idea. So Docker is is Docker and containers are kind of separate from each other. Containers existed before Docker came along. What Docker did was produce a, a they sort of invented a much more productive, easier way to interact with them. And as a result, um, the Docker API, if you like, or the Docker approach to building uh, to working with containers has become the dominant um, approach to doing it. Yeah. So why would you want to do this? Well, if you've ever had this sort of thought, hopefully you've never actually said this to a customer, um, but you've possibly thought it. You know, a customer rings up, says the application's not working. You try it on your machine and it works, yeah? So the problem is some difference, some difference in 
configuration between your machine and the machine they're running it on, some difference in a version of a library that it depends on, or um, they're using a later version of MySQL or something, some dependency that your application has, whether it's part of the operating system's configuration or whether it's a, a library that it depends on or something else, is different. Yeah. And this, this comes about because our development environment is generally not the deployment environment. Yeah, they're different from each other. Yeah, sometimes wildly different. And, and as much as we can, we try and make them similar, but they're still different from each other. Yeah. So the idea with containers is ultimately to say they're not different. They're the same. If I build a container that contains all of my, um, my application and all of its dependencies, then ultimately I could take that container that I built in development and used during development and deploy the same thing into production. Yeah. So that so that there are no differences or, or the, the differences between production and, and development are as small as possible. Yeah. So that's the idea. Yeah. But like I said before, rushing from learning what Docker is at the beginning of a webinar through to using it in production at the end of the webinar, that's very bold. Yeah, that's a courageous move. So we're going to focus on using it in development first until we get comfortable with it. Yeah. Now, one common response to um, this, this idea is, well, hang on, isn't that what a VM is? With a VM, I can package up everything that my application depends on. Um, and and potentially even deploy that VM into production, yeah. So isn't is a container the same as a VM? Well, it, it's not. But you are right. A VM kind of satisfies those um, that definition, yeah. Um, but there are some subtle difference differences and important differences. And it and it's not a case that containers are better than VMs or worse than VMs. They're just different. Yeah, and so you have to understand the difference. So on the left hand side of this picture, um, this is this is the VM scenario. So forget about containers for a second. You've possibly most of you have played around with VMs, I'm guessing virtual machines, whether it's through VirtualBox or VMware or something like that. And the idea with a virtual uh, machine is that you've got um, your host operating system where you're running your VM. Yeah. Um, but then inside your VM, you've got a full uh, operating system. You might install a full version of Linux in there or a full version of of Windows or something like that. Yeah. And then on top of that, you might install any libraries and dependencies that your application has. Um, and then you'd install your application. Yep. And so this VM is literally everything yep, from the, the operating system up. Yeah. And that's awesome in some ways because, you know, you get this complete separation between your applications. Like in this scenario, we've got app one in its own VM and we've got app two in its own VM. And even if app one and app two have um, dependencies on the same library, but maybe different versions. Yeah, that's fine because they're, they're totally separate from each other. They're in, they've got a full separate operating system from each other. Yeah. Awesome. That's, that sounds great. Yeah. Whereas Docker and containers is the picture on the right hand side where we're not the, the key difference here is that we're not installing the full operating system inside our container. Yeah, you can see app one there, the green parts, app one and the, the binaries and the libraries that it depends on. Yep. And configuration files and whatever else. That's all that's in your container. Yeah. The the operating system, it actually leverages the operating system and most importantly, it leverages the kernel of the of the host uh, that it's running on. Yeah. So in my case, uh, in the scenario today, I'm going to be running Docker on Mac OS. So it's actually leveraging those things from from Mac OS. If you're running Docker on Windows, it hasn't got it's inside your container. You don't have a full copy of your operating system. You're actually leveraging the um, the underlying host in that case Windows um, to, to use the, the the kernel and those sorts of things yeah now this difference it, it, this makes a few differences yeah um, you can even just look at this picture and see that one difference 
is that the containers are smaller than the VMs. Yeah, uh, even just on this picture, yeah, there, there, there's less pixels height. Yeah, well, that's purposely. Yeah, um, VMs tend to be more heavyweight than than containers because they've got the full copy of an operating system in there. Of course, they're more heavyweight. Yeah, whereas the containers are, are leveraging the 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 uh, operating system of the host. Yeah, so containers tend to be much more lightweight. Um, as a result, their performance tends to be better. Yeah, um, their their startup performance is way better. Yeah, you start a, a virtual machine even on a really impressive server that's set up to to start virtual machines. You're talking startup time of minutes from if you're starting from nothing to having a virtual machine available. We're talking minutes. Yeah. As you'll see in with Docker in during the demos here, we're talking startup time of milliseconds. And the reason is it doesn't have to boot an entire machine. It doesn't have to load the kernel and do all these things. They're already sitting there ready to go. Yeah. So startup time way faster. Um, yeah. Uh, and as a result of all of that, it requires less memory. I can run way more containers on my machine than I can run VMs because they each need less memory, less you know, there's less resources that each of them requires. Yeah. Um, now, it may sound like I'm saying containers are awesome, VMs are terrible. Yeah, that's not the case. There's definitely things that VMs are better. If you look at this and even think about that picture on the previous slide, um, VMs have much better isolation between the processes that they're running. Yeah. If we go back to this picture, um, App 1 here and App 2 here are not as well separated from each other as App 1 and App 2 are over here in the virtual machine world. Yeah, because ultimately they are sharing um, the, 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 they're running as processes on the same, ultimate, ultimately on the same host. Yeah, whereas over here, these are full instances of operating systems that are separated from each other. Yeah, so it's not a case that containers good, VMs bad. VMs from a security point of view and from a, a, a isolation point of view, much, much, uh, a much better story if those things matter to you, yeah? Whereas containers only have that process level isolation, yeah? So that's still pretty secure, but probably no, no, no real arguing that it's less secure than, than a VM, than two separate VMs, yeah? But that's the key part. Is if you if all you remember from this is that containers are lighter weight and the reason they're lighter weight is because they don't have a full copy of an operating system. Yeah, they're sharing ultimately, the they leveraging that host operating system. If that's what you walk away from this with, then that's that's enough. Yeah. Another thing to think about with containers is the the file system. Yeah, they use this thing called a layered file system. So a container is based off an image. Yeah. And so when you build up containers, you basically are almost inheriting from um, a previous image. Yeah. So in this case, we've started with our very first image, which might just be a Linux operating system image. And we've added all of the Apache modules to that. Yeah. And that creates a new image. Yeah. Then in the next uh, container that we want to create. We're going to create that based off that earlier image that we created, but we're also going to add all of the Git binaries. Yep. And so that creates a new image, yep, image 1.2. Then we might create another one off it, yep, uh, where we're inheriting, if you like, from image 1.2, and then we're adding the, the source and the binaries for our application. Yep. Uh, but these are kind of like um, you can kind of think of these as being like um, classes um, in 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 Delphi, yeah, um, where, and with inheritance between them, yeah. So we've got a class, we inherit from it. We've got a base class, we inherit it from it. We add a few things, then we might create another class that inherits from that, yeah. Um, so that's how the file system works in in uh, containers as well, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll do some demos. Some of the first demos I do will try and highlight this for you. Yeah. Um, but the, the key thing to understand here is that a container is a runtime artifact and it's based off an image. Yeah. So we create an image 
uh, which which is where we specify what the, the, the base image that we're, I want to stop saying inherited from, but I'll, I'll say it one more time, the base image that we're inheriting from or that we're building on top of, and then we add whatever files and, and other pieces to it that we want, yeah, and that creates a new image. And then that image we might base a new one off and add some more to it. And then when we go to run a container, we basically say, what image do we want to base this container off? Okay, the demo hopefully will make it all clear. Yeah. Um, so what we end up with, um, this is a little bit strange, this, this image, but if you look at it from the bottom up, yeah, we've, we've created a, a container which is base, basically built off all of the image layers that are, that are in between. Yeah? So like in this scenario, if we were creating an instance of this final container, our, our ultimate container would be based off image 1, image 1.1, image 1.2, and then whatever source we we're adding. So as you go up from the bottom here, you can see each of those images that we are, um, that we are using, they all get these sort of weird looking IDs yeah, generated for them. And then at the very top, we take all of those images and at the very top, we add a writable file system layer. Yeah. So inside our container, we can make changes. We can write additional files, all those sorts of things. They don't go into the images underneath. They go into that writable container layer sitting on top. Yeah. Now, I've been talking a lot here. Okay. And I'm not sure I've made it any clearer. So I, what I'll do now is I'll jump out and we'll do a demo where I'll try and make this idea of images and image, um, sort of one image building on top of another and this writable file system sitting on top of it. I'll try and make that a bit clearer. Let's actually have a look at our very first Docker demo. It's not going to be terribly impressive, but I want to do a few demos just of really basic stuff. So we, just so we can start to reinforce some of what we were just talking about in terms of um, containers and this um, uh, layered file system uh, and what happens when containers go away and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So let's try and run uh, an, uh, uh, an instance of a Docker Linux container. Yeah, I'm doing, uh, as you can see, I'm doing this on, on a Mac. Um, makes no difference. From, from Docker's point of view, you can run it on Windows, you can run it on Mac, and, and everything that I do here will work on a Windows box. Um, there's actually an argument to be had that Windows might be a more flexible um, host to be doing your Docker stuff on. Um, We'll talk about that later on when we get to Windows containers, yeah? But for now, it doesn't matter that I'm on a Mac. You can follow along and do it on Windows, okay? So let's try and run a basic Linux container, yeah? So let's have a look at the, con the command. Oh, I should have said, I've got Docker installed, yeah? So I'm assuming you've installed Docker, yeah? Uh, I don't know what version of Docker I've got. There we go, 19.03, but a, a, a fairly recent version of Docker, yeah? Um, so let's have a look. If I say docker container uh, run, yeah, um, so I'm saying I want to run a docker container, yeah, that's not terribly uh, startling, uh, but I need to tell it what sort of container I want to run, okay, and I want to run, in this case, an Ubuntu container, yeah, Ubuntu Linux. Um, now, We'll talk about where all these names come from, like Ubuntu and, and what else, what you could stick in there instead. But for now, let's just run with this, yeah? Um, I tell it to run. The first thing it comes up and says is that I'm unable to find this image, Ubuntu, uh, locally, yeah? So then the next line, it says I'm pulling it from this place, library Ubuntu. Yep, and so it's uh, uh, going to, in this case, my local cache um, to pull down the Ubuntu image. Yeah, but later on you'll see I'll do one where it doesn't even have it in the local cache and um, it has to pull it down over the internet. Yep, and we'll have a look at that. But for now, it's got this um, image, yeah, Ubuntu, in this case, Ubuntu colon latest. Yeah, um, so it's got this uh, and then it kind of looks like nothing happened, yeah? If I open another um, tab here and say docker um, uh, container 
list. We'll see. There's, there's no there's no containers in our list. Yeah, there's no containers running. Um, so kind of it's a bit weird. It's what happened. Well, what actually happened is it started up our container, um, but because we hadn't told it what to do, yeah. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can kind of tell it what to r run um, uh, when you start a container. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of different ways, but the, the basic way is on the command line, you can tell it, run this container and execute this thing in it. Yeah, but I didn't tell it that. I just said start the container. So it started it up, found that there was, I hadn't told it what to run. And so then it just shut down as well. Yeah, so it came and went quite quickly. So instead, if I want to tell it to actually do something, yeah, I need to give it some some parameters. Yeah, uh, minus it uh, is basically telling it that I want to uh, an interactive um, terminal. Yeah, so I want to run this container, open up a, a, an interactive session with it, and in this case, what I want it to run is the bash shell. Okay. So now, when I run this, it shouldn't have to re-download the, the image, yeah, because it's already got it, but it hopefully won't immediately stop, yeah. So you, you can tell this Malcolm at business here is my MacBook, yeah. Um, but when I run this, we can see that the prefix on my um, terminal here changes to root at 289 blah blah blah, yeah. I'm in a in a Ubuntu Linux prompt here, yeah. Uh, we can tell that in a couple of different ways. If I come back over to this other tab and I get it to list my containers again, we can now see that there is one running. There's one with this container ID of 289 blah 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 10b, yeah, which if you notice is that same ID that I've got in my um, shell prompt. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's listed. Uh, it's based on the Ubuntu image. Great. The command it's running is the bin bash command. Awesome. Uh, this was created 19 seconds ago at the time that I ran this and it's been up at that point for 19 seconds. Uh, it's not uh, using any ports. We'll look at ports later on. And because I didn't name my container, it gave it a, it automatically gave it a name called Eloquent Lamar. Some of the names that, that Docker gives to uh, the containers are pretty awesome. Um, I don't think I could have thought of a better name than Eloquent Lamar, so I, I tend to go with the default ones. Okay, so Eloquent Lamar. So we can see that that's running, but here we've actually got an interactive shell with it. So if I do a present working directory, we can see we're in the, the root folder of this Ubuntu. Um, uh, well, all we can see is that we're in the root folder of this Unix based um, system. But we can actually have a look and see what it is if I do a cat etc. Let's actually have a look at what we're running. We can see that this uh, Linux th that we're attached to is a uh, it's based on Ubuntu version 18.04. Uh, we can see various details about it. Uh, it's Debian based. We can see all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So we've actually in here got um, uh, we're logged into a Linux uh, a shell inside this this Linux system that's running in this container, yeah. And if I exit out of here quickly, okay, we're back to the Mac uh, Mac OS prompt, uh, and we go and have another list of our containers that are running. We can see that there's now no containers running, yeah. So the, when I was talking earlier about um, one of the strengths of Docker containers over virtual machines is how quickly they start up and how quickly they go away. You can see that here. Yeah, if we once the image is downloaded, if we if I rerun that same command, it's you know, less than a second before we're in with access to our Linux container. That's gone from Linux container not running to spun up going and available f and with a shell available for me yeah you won't I don't care what machine you're on you won't get a VM going from cold to available that fast yeah so that's one of the upsides but as we talked about there's there's upsides of VMs as well but that's definitely an example of how fast it is to spin up these containers yeah 
but let's do a little bit more um, in here um, we're in in this uh, Linux container let's just uh, go to my home directory in here so we're in the root directory if we have a look there's no subdirectories so let's create one uh, I'll create one called test so we should be able to see that now awesome and if I CD into test um, let me um, uh, let me create a file yeah um, I'll do uh, echo hello test into my test uh, no I'm using test a lot uh, what else would I call it of course I'd call it foo into my foo file so now I've got a file in this test directory called foo and if I cat foo we can see the contents yeah Awesome, so we've got a Linux box, we've created a file, created a directory, created a file, yeah. Now let's exit out of here, yeah, so my Linux system has gone away. Um, and if we, just to check that, if I list the containers that are running, we can see that there's none. Fantastic. Let's start a container again, okay, and go back to my root direct, uh, to my home directory. Let's see, notice my folder is gone, yeah? So one thing to realize is that changes you make in an interactive session with a Docker container are um, transient, yeah, they're, or what's the cool word, ephemeral, yeah, they, they go away. Um, they're, they're not persistent, yeah? We'll look, we'll talk about volumes later on and look at how we can make changes to the file system um, uh, uh, persistent but by default we've got a Linux box here and we can make changes in it um, but then when we shut that container all of those changes are gone yeah now you might think of that as a weakness well it is a weakness if you want them to be persistent yeah <laughs> um, but it's not necessarily a weakness yeah um, we'll like I said we'll talk about how we can make file system changes that are persistent um, a couple of different ways but this um, is also potentially a strength. Um, one of the ways that this um, is a strength is um, when it comes to testing, I find. Yeah? Um, the knowledge that my container, when it starts, is always in exactly the same state. Yeah? If I'm using a container and I'm running tests, uh, unit tests or automated tests or whatever on my system, um, I'm really confident that there's that the tests aren't just working because there's some leftover file from a previous run or something like that. I know that each time the runs are, the test runs are starting from exactly the same um, starting point. Yeah. So um, you know, if, if as I make changes and test them in my container, um, you know, changes to my code or whatever, and test it in my container, I kind of know that. If, if the tests pass, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot more confidence that, that those um, test results are, or, or the, the changes that I've made really did fix it, because it's not just some configuration change or file system change hanging around from before, because we got a clean slate every single time we run it. Yeah. Okay, let me exit out of here. You'll notice that uh, before when we are in there, we got um, Ubuntu 18.04. Yeah. What if we we didn't want 1804 what if we wanted a particular version of ubuntu maybe we we've got a customer contacting us and saying that the application fails when we run it on um, ubuntu 16 1604 or something yeah so we can actually start up a container of a particular version yeah so before we saw that when i just said ubuntu i ended up with ubuntu latest what I want to do is not run the latest version of Ubuntu, but a specific version. So what we can do is tag one of the specific Ubuntu version numbers on the end. Yeah, and I'll show you where to find these in a second. But for now, by saying this, I'm saying, you know, I want to run a container. I want an interactive session with it. The, um, the base image that I want you to, to use to create this container is not just Ubuntu, which will default to the latest, but it's Ubuntu and this particular tag or version number 16.04. So now when I run this, again, it can't find it locally. Uh, so it's pulling from, um, uh, from the, the Ubuntu library. 
it's downloaded it I've got my session but if I now do um, cat etc oops not dollar sign okay we can see that whereas before we were running Ubuntu 18.04 now we've got Ubuntu 16.04 yeah so pulling down a particular version and switching from the latest version to a prior version is super easy it's just a command line yeah um, it needs to pull down that image but um, once it's got that I can I can jump my tests or, or whatever I'm doing I can jump between these different versions I don't have to have a particular VM maintained where this is my Ubuntu 16 and this is my Ubuntu 18 and this is my some other flavor of Linux I can just grab the version of Linux container that I want yeah okay um, so uh, one more thing actually before we leave this demo um, before, over here I was showing the list of running containers yeah but as we saw, as we um, start up these these containers, if locally we don't have the image that we're specifying, it will download it. Yeah. Um, so it can be handy to see what um, what images you've got downloaded locally. So if we say Docker image list instead of Docker container list, container is kind of your <coughs> excuse me container. Think of a container as a running instance. Um, whereas an image is kind of the the class, if you like, it, it's like classes and objects. It's it's what it, the image is the um, what it's based off. The container is the runtime instance. Yeah. Uh, so if I do Docker image list, we can see here in my local cache we've got two images: Ubuntu 16.04 and Ubuntu latest. Yeah. Um, and so now I can create instances of those and it, it because it's got them in the local cache it doesn't have to do any any downloading okay all right let's have a bit more of a chat and then we'll come back and do some more demos so now that we've got that a perfectly reasonable follow-up question from there is where do I get these images from I've just been create I've just done a demo where I created a bunch of um, containers based off images where were those images coming from so that's what i want to have a look at now these images are coming down from a from a, a, a um, uh, an online repository yeah now it's possible to have your own uh, repository in-house um, and then also there are public uh, repositories um, you can have that are online yeah but the default one if you don't go through and set up your own repository um, the, the 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 default one is the one at hub.docker.com so if you just hit hub.docker.com in your um, in your browser uh, it's run by docker it's just referred to as docker hub um, and it's gives you amongst other things it gives you a a place where you can host your own um, images um, but also a big public library of of um, other people's images yeah so when you list your images in here um, you can decide whether they're going to be private or public yeah so uh, if we come here to, to docker.hub and come to the containers tab we can then search for and let's go and search for that Ubuntu um, image that we were just using a moment ago yeah um, so here we go there's a whole bunch with Ubuntu in the name but here's the Ubuntu image that I was using and you can see it's it's the official image from Ubuntu themselves uh, there's umpty squillion downloads and all the rest of it um, but if we click on this and go in um, you can see a bunch of things uh, including uh, how to pull that image down locally so you can just use the docker pull Ubuntu image uh, you can see different um, architectures that you can get it for um, x86 um, etc etc okay um, but these you can also see there's a bunch of tags now tags are how docker sort of names things yeah um, so when you create an image you you specify one or more tags for that that image um, and these can be everything from the the Ubuntu name itself which is is what we use to reference it but but also things like version numbers so we said for example that we wanted Ubuntu colon we just said Ubuntu and that defaulted to Ubuntu colon latest yeah well here's that latest tag here so we could have also said Ubuntu colon bionic and would have got the same 
same image used, or we could have been specific about the version number and said 1804. Um, all of those things would have got that same image to come down. But when we said in the second example where, that we wanted Ubuntu colon 16.04, this is the one that we ended up with. So we've got this Docker Hub, this repository of all of these images that everybody else has made for us. Awesome. It stands to reason that if all these other people have made these images and shared them, we must be able to make images. So how, let's have a look at how we do that. So before I started up a Ubuntu uh, image, uh, created some files and directories and then exited the container, uh, went back into it again, started it up again, and we saw that those files were gone. Yeah. So let's have a look at the scenario where we, we don't want that to occur. When we start up our application, we want our files, directories, structure, configuration details all already created in the image. How do we do that? How do we create an image for our application, for example? Yeah. So how we do that is based off the, the, the easiest way. There's a couple of ways you can do it, but the easiest way is based off a thing called a Docker file. And a Docker file basically goes through and specifies the base image that this, Im that the, your image is going to be based off. And then what changes you want to make to that base image to make it into your, to, to have what, what you want in your image in it. Yeah. So let's uh, create um, a directory here. Um, uh, I'm in my uh, Docker directory, so let's make a subdirectory called example one. Okay. Uh, and then actually I've got an editor open. So let me jump over here inside my editor. Let's create a new file, which is going to be called, um, let me save it. Let's save it in here and we'll give it the name of uh, Docker file. Yeah. It doesn't have to be called that, but, but by default you call it that. Uh, it's kind of a convention. Yeah. Um, so, Here's my Docker file. So as I said before, I want to do two things in here. I want to specify what base image my image is going to be um, going to inherit from a particular image. So that, for that, we use the from uh, statement. So I'm saying from Ubuntu. And in my case, I don't want to just say latest or leave it up to, to the default. I want to um, specify that my image is going to be based off Ubuntu 16.04. Okay. The other thing that I said you do in a Docker file, I said that you specify what image you're you're basing your your custom image off. The second thing that you do is specify whatever commands that you want to um, have executed as as part of creating that image. Yeah. Um, so we you do that using the run command, yeah. So I can say uh, run, and then whatever commands I want to set up the image the way that I want it set up. Okay. So in my case, I went through, I ran cd uh, to my home directory, okay. Uh, and then I said run, uh, or then I said make the um, test I think I did can't even remember what I did now and then I said um, echo uh, hello test into a foo file okay so in theory you can go through and just stick a whole bunch of run commands in here uh, you can install packages you can um, uh, depending on your flavor of Linux, you can pull down other other packages to be installed. You can you can uh, do really whatever you like. You can open up ports, all that kind of stuff. But it, it basically what happens is for every one of these run commands, it will create a new image. Yeah. So here I'm going to start with my Ubuntu 16.04 image. It will then create an image inheriting from that, if you like, or based on that. Um, that contains the changes after we've done the CD home or tilde uh, character. Yeah. And then 
it will create another image of that one which has that in it plus the results of doing a, a make the test yeah? then it will create another image based off that with the changes of echo hello test you know into foo yeah so you end up with all of these interim images yeah which can be fine but it's a bit slow and it's a bit i don't know messy in my view um, what i often find is that i do it this way during um, while i'm testing out while i'm getting it working um, because what it means is if my first two commands here worked and then my third one let's say i misspelled echo and that failed um, next time i built that image it wouldn't have to go back and redo the first one it could just pick it up from the last successful run command and keep going yeah so it can be really useful in in development um, but then once you know that your commands work often it's sort of nicer and easier to chain them together like this where um, I put them all basically in one uh, run command like that yeah so that won't create any um, interim images for this yeah it'll grab the base image and then create a new image based off that which has the results of running my change directory then my make dir then my uh, echo into a piped into a file okay make sense so I mean this is super simple but if we save this um, docker file and if I come back out here and have a look um, if I have a look in my example directory there's my docker file okay um, so let's go into uh, that directory now I want to build an image based off that docker file so if I say docker image build um, and give it oh, better spelt docker right docker image build the name of my docker uh, the name of my docker file now if I've called it docker file I don't actually need to specify the name I just need to specify the directory where to find it yep and it's in the current directory so I can just do that if it was in some other directory I'd need to give the path to that directory yep and if I hadn't called it docker file if I called it something else I'd need to say dot slash whatever I'd called this file yeah so I give it the name of the docker file and then I want to specify that, that what, it, what this image should be called just like when they created the Ubuntu image um, they had it called Ubuntu yeah um, I want to give this a name yeah so I'm going to call this my um, uh, what will I call this so I'll call it minus T for tagging it so I'll call it minus T um, basic basic example yeah that'll do it's not the best name ever but whatever so let's do this and see what happens so we can see step one of two here it went off it ran the from command yeah and it went and it found my ubuntu 1604 image locally because we used it before awesome it then went to step two of two where it created an image based off that one but that contained the results of executing these uh, commands yeah and you can see um, it's then created that in a container called that horrible ID yeah but then at the end it's tagged it with the name that I gave it basic example colon latest yeah and when you do minus T wherever I did it here that can be a list of tags so I could have as we saw with the Ubuntu one I could have given it a bunch of names so now if I say uh, docker image list we should see that we've got three images locally uh, one called Ubuntu 1604 one called Ubuntu latest and one called basic example um, uh, um, latest and that image ID that we've got here should be the same image ID that we have here yeah so now instead of doing my earlier command of uh, docker container run Ubuntu 1604 what I'm going to do is say I want to run a docker container I want an interactive uh, I want to interact with it but I'm going to run basic example yeah and we're into our container yeah let's have a look over here what have we got running we can see we've got a container called romantic Boyd 
fantastic name. Uh, it's been going for seven odd seconds, uh, but the image that it's based off is now this basic example image, the one that we created using our Docker file. Yeah. Uh, and so if we have a look, what's the present working directory? Let me CD into my home directory. Ooh, oh, oh, ah, there's an error in my um, make file in my uh, docker file. You can see I created, I did a make dir to create my folder. I didn't change to that folder. Yeah, very good. But anyway, we'll, we'll fix that. Okay, but anyway, for, the, for now, let's just check. It's created me a subdirectory called test. It's done exactly what I asked. I just asked it to do the wrong thing. And let's have a look at the contents of the foo file. Awesome. And now if I exit that and go back in, that should be persistent because we've actually baked that into our image, um, into our, our, our uh, container image. Yeah. So even though we start up multiple copies of that in different places on different machines, those that subdirectory and that foo file that we created is is there. Now let's just fix the mistake that I made. What I should have done, or what I can do, is in between these two steps is to change into that test subdirectory that I've created and then just append the lines together. Yeah. So now if we save this and uh, build our uh, image, our, our basic example image again, okay, it's, it has, it's run our statement again, uh, created a new ID. Uh, if I then run up uh, an instance of basic example. Now, hopefully, if we change to our thing, yes, we should have our test subdirectory. And then if I go into that subdirectory, we should have our foo file with the, the correct contents in it. Cool. And again, it's persistent yeah, because it's baked into the image. Awesome. Now that's fine if you want those files to be unchangeable and baked into your image yeah um, because let's have a look okay let's go back into our image okay go into test let's now um, can we remove foo yep I've deleted the foo file okay let's exit go back in run it. I shouldn't say go back in because it's not the same container that's currently running. It's a new instance of that container and you can see that it gives it a new ID. Yeah. Um, if we foos back again. Yeah. Because my file system changes are not persistent. Yeah. Every time I run an instance of this image, I get the same starting point. Yeah. We'll see in a little while what you can do if you don't want that. If you actually want to have file system changes that persist between um, containers. Yeah. Um, just to sort of drive this home, let's create another um, another Docker file example. Yeah. So what directory are we in here? Uh, let me go back out and let me make example two. Okay, uh, let's where's example two? Here's my Docker file. This one um, I'm going to say from, but it's not from Ubuntu. I'm going to say that it's from basic example. So I'm going to create a new uh, container image. Yep based off the container image I created a second ago. Yeah, so it's going to be based off the result of this one. Um, and so in this one, what I'm going to do is run uh, uh, what did we call the directory? Yeah, let's create a CD test. Yep. And we're going to make uh, another subdirectory called test2. 
Uh, we're going to echo some more contents. into a bar file, okay? So it's based off this one. So it should inherit the test directory and the foo file, yeah? Um, and let's actually, let's be tricky while we're in here. Um, we're gonna change into here. And in this one, I wanna remove the foo file, yeah? And then instead create a subdirectory called test2 and inside that, have a file called bar yeah now if I haven't missed anything there I should be able to come out here what directory am I in yeah I'm in the right place so let's create a new image based off this docker file uh, but I'm not going to call it basic example I'll call it less basic example okay and what can we see? We can see step one, it ran the from command and pulled in my basic example image. And then it ran these commands and gave me back this uh, a, a container with this ID. Yeah. And then I named it less basic example. Yeah. So if I now run an, uh, an instance of that image, okay, uh, let's go into the home directory. Let's have a look. Yeah, there's my test directory. Should be no foo file. Excellent. <laughs> and I made the same mistake again. I created the subdirectory. I didn't change into it before I created the, far, the bar file, but whatever. I won't go back and fix that one. Um, but then let's have a look at the bar file. Yeah, it says hello again. So an image can make changes to its parent image. Yeah. Um, but then any changes that you make when in a container based off that image are not persistent. Does that make sense? So in the earlier example, I started a, 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 a container based off basic example and I deleted the foo file. When I exited out of that container and started a new instance, the foo file was back. Yeah. But this time I, in my Docker file, I created a new image um, from that basic example image and I removed the foo file here. And then when I create an instance of this uh, image as a container, then I don't see the foo file. Yeah? Because there's this layered file system where we, we kind of, for want of a better word, inherit the changes. Yeah? Obviously, if I go back in and run up an instance, oh, let me, I'm still in the container. Yeah? Uh, if I run up an instance of the basic example one, it's still there. And the foo file is still in the test directory, yeah? But in the less basic example image, that's been overwritten, if you like, yeah? Okay, so if you want to have files, file system changes and applications installed or whatever that are persistent in your image, then that's where you would start creating a Docker file. Okay, we'll kind of come back in a second and look at other ways of doing this, yeah? So based on the demos that we've just seen, a perfectly you know, reasonable question at this point is, well, I want to be able to share files between containers. I want some of my file system changes to persist between um, containers that are running, yeah? So how do we do that? So that's where we need to talk about volumes. Okay, so what we're going to do is create a folder on my local machine, my Mac machine in this case, or if you're using Windows on your Windows machine, create a folder there um, and share that, mount that if you like, into your running container so that uh, inside your container it looks like a local folder, but any changes you make to that are actually persisted out to the um, to your folder on your Windows box, or in my case, on my Mac box. And then when we run another instance of a container and mount that local folder, um, those changes are still visible, yeah? Um, so Docker, like I mentioned before, Docker refers to this as a volume. So the first thing we need to do is create that local directory that's going to be our uh, shared volume, yeah? Uh, so let me... Um, uh, I think of demos, docker, 
I think that's the directory I was in. Yeah. So let me create a folder um, uh, called, I don't know, local volume. We'll just call it that. Okay. Um, and if we want to, we can go in and create some files in there. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, uh, let's just create a, uh, let's just echo. This is on Mac into a file called um, file one. You can see I'm running out of ideas for what to call these things. So there's my uh, local volume. Yeah. And I want to mount that into my running container. Yeah. So let's go back to our um, command for our uh, less basic example. Yep. So here's our, our docker container run command that we used before. Docker container run minus it to give us an interactive uh, session. Uh, the name of the image, this less basic example image that we created, and we want to run up a bash shell as the uh, command. That that command actually there where I've got bin bash could be something else. Could be the name of a of an executable that you want to run. Yeah, whatever. In this case, I'm running a bash shell. Um, so, but this won't have the the command as it stands it doesn't know anything about my local volume. So I, I need to go back and um, put in an extra um, some extra commands to the run command or some extra parameters I should say to my run command yeah and to, to mount a volume I, I say minus V yeah now basically I have to map my local volume the the, the folder on my um, on my Mac machine or you on your Windows machine let's say I have to map that to what it's going to be called in the inside the container yep so the first one is the host version and then the sec host name if you like or the host path and then the second part is the container path yeah so on my host this folder is called um, documents docker uh, no demos docker local volume yeah that's what I uh, created if we have a look further up uh, where was it? Yeah, I created a local volume. Yep. So that's what it's known as on, that's the path to it, if you like, on my host machine, on my Mac or your Windows machine. We then need to say where to map it to inside the container. Inside the container, it was called something like, I think, root uh, test and then I'm, the name I want it to be to see as is, is common. Yep. So when we're inside the container, we should be able to go to root test common. And then when we look at that, we should see the contents of this local volume on my Mac machine. Yeah. And any changes we make in there should persist out to my Mac. Um, and they'll be then available the next time we run a container with this command. Yep. Okay. So we've got our container. Uh, if we cd to my home directory and have a look there's my test folder and if we now have a look there's bar and test2 that we created in our docker file but now we've now got a common folder and if we have a look at what's in the common folder we can see file1 yeah which was the file we created out here yeah? so it should have inside it this is on mac yeah so if we cat that uh, what was it? Common uh, file one. We should see this is on Mac. And in fact, if we create another file in there called echo changes from inside container. Call it file two. Okay, we should be able to see that. File two, awesome. Um, I won't exit the container yet, uh, but if we jump out just to my local machine and have a look, there's my local volume. If 
we have a look, file 2 is already there. Yeah? And in fact, even if we uh, exit out of our container, yeah, so it's no longer running, we can still see file 2 there. Let's have a look at what the contents is. Oops, sorry, not files 2. Yeah. Now let's go and create another instance of the container. Yeah, and this is before where we would have seen those uh, changes that we'd made inside the container. Uh, they were transient before, they were not saved, but in this case, because we made them inside a shared volume, we should still be able to see them. They've been shared between container instances. Uh, so if we go into test, common should still be there, and if we have a look, file 2 still is there as well. Yeah, awesome. So now, using volumes, we can have uh, changes that persist between containers. They don't have to be changes that were introduced in our um, uh, in, in our Docker file, they can actually be changes created while during the runtime of the container, and then even if we shut down that container and start it up again, those changes have persisted. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so we've gone a, a fair way through now. We can um, we can use images. We kind of understand how we have these image layers and they build up. Um, and, and to, to let us create a container based off those images. We even know how to create our own images and inside those and, and install any files and whatever we want inside those those images. Um, we've also just had a look at how we can share files uh, and, and volumes between containers so that we can have some persistent changes between them. Um, the next thing to have a look at is how is how we can use um, ports, or how we can have um, something inside of our container communicate over a, over a network port. Yeah, like for example, a web server, which is the example we're going to have a look at in a second, where we want it to listen on a particular port and then respond on that. Well, we need to be in control of what those ports are and which ones we expose and which ones we don't. Expose. So let's have a look at how we get, uh, how we do uh, ports, how we work with ports inside Docker. If you have a look on Docker Hub, there's there's a lot more um, repositories that you can actually, or images that you can actually access. Pretty much anything you can think of. So if you want databases, uh, you, there's all sorts of different MySQL or Postgres. Um, images that you can use. We're going to use a couple of these in a, in a little while so we can have a look at spinning up some databases. But um, there's also um, web servers, yeah, uh, pretty much, uh, and, and, and way more. Like if you can think of an application that's, um, that's out there, you can probably find a, um, a, an image for it on Docker Hub, yeah. Uh, as you can see down the left hand side in terms of the categories, there's messaging systems, there's monitoring systems, there's uh, different setups for for programming languages and storage and security. There's Windows uh, images, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so there's a whole bunch, but there's one in here that I want to use um, called, which is a, a, an Apache image. Yeah, this Clover Apache image. Now, one thing to realize bef before we get into Clover Apache is that um, with most of these images up here, you can actually see the Docker file that was used to create it. So just like we created Docker files to create our images, um, these images have also been mostly based off um, uh, Docker files, yeah? And you can see here, you know, there's more commands. We've looked at very few of the commands in it, but the core ones are the ones we've looked at. You know, there's a from statement where they're specifying what image they're using as their base. Uh, and then there's one or more run statements, which are basically all of the things they're doing to change the, uh, the, the this image from its base. Yeah. So we're going to use this Clover Apache image. Yeah. And now I haven't used it on this machine before, so when we actually go to pull it down, we should see it pulling it down from Docker, Docker Hub. Yeah. So like we saw before, we want to say Docker container run okay and in a second i'll give it the name um, clover apache this is a web server so there's probably two additional things that we will want to do with this now number one it's a web server so it wants to serve up 
HTML files and other things to the internet. Yeah, so we probably want to point it at some HTML files and CSS files and images and all the other things that we want to use. Maybe we're using this to test our website yeah, as our local test instance before we push it up to our production Apache instance. Yeah, so we might have a local directory which is where we're developing all of our HTML and our CSS and whatever else. Um, and using the volumes technique that we saw a second ago, we can map that local directory with our HTML file into a directory inside that a Clover Apache container. Yeah. So if we have a look, um, I've got a, um, I'll do it over here. Uh, what's working directory? If I come out of that local volume directory and have a look, I've got a directory here. Sorry, I'm trying to do too many things at once. I've got a directory here called webroot. And if we have a look inside that webroot directory, it's got a file called index.html. And inside index.html is just some really super bare bones HTML. Yeah, could be, could easily be lots more complicated than this and other images and, and CSS files and whatever else you want. Yeah, but here's my web files that I want to test. Yeah, so the first thing that I probably want to do is use the volume, the minus V command that we saw a second ago to map that local directory, uh, which is uh, my home directory documents, uh, demos, docker, webroot, I think. Yeah. Map that into a particular um, folder inside my container. Now, because this container is an Apache container, I can map it into var www. So the contents of my web root will replace that var slash www folder inside my container. Yeah, so that's great. The other thing that a web server does typically is listen on a network port. Yep listen for web requests coming, HTTP requests coming in on a particular port and then replies to them. Yeah. Now we saw before, you may not have really noticed, but we saw before when we were doing this docker container list command, we were starting up these containers and they, the ports column here was, was empty. They weren't listening on any ports. By default, your containers aren't, don't have access to sort of the outside internet. You've got to specify what ports are going to be available to to your containers yeah and this is kind of like we did with the volumes with the volumes we said here's this local folder and i'm going to map it into this named folder inside the container well the ports are the same what i'm going to say is that here's a local port on my mac in my case and i'm going to map it into this particular named port inside the container yeah so here, we, we don't use minus V for this because minus V is for volumes. Instead, what we can use is minus P for ports. So if I say minus P, I need to give it a local port yeah, uh, on my Mac. So I'm going to say 8086 just because I'm old. Um, so my local port 8086, and I want to map that into port 80 inside, my, um, inside this Apache container. So in the browser, I'm going to hit port 8086, but that'll be translated into whatever um, Apache internally in the container is listening on port 80. So they'll, that it'll map that into that. Okay. Now before we still have, so that we've got Docker container run minus V for my volume minus P for my ports. That's a new bit. And then before we said minus IT um, and then the name of the uh, image. Yeah, we used minus IT before because we wanted an interactive session. Yeah, I was starting up the bash shell and so I wanted to be able to type into it. I wanted to be able to interact with it. Here, my interaction is going to be through the browser, not through the terminal session. So I don't really want to start up a, an interactive session through this terminal, through this command prompt. Yeah. So instead of minus IT, I'm going to do minus D IT. Minus D basically tells it to start this in the background or as a daemon. Uh, on on Linux, yeah. 
So what this means is when I do this, well, let's actually do it. Okay, can't find the Apache Clover Apache image locally. It's going to pull it down from uh, Docker Hub so we can see it downloading. Okay, grabbing all of the uh, images. Okay, it's got them. Okay, started them up. Yeah, but it's given me back my Mac OS prompt. That's because I told it to start as a minus D, as a minus, as a daemon, start in the background. If we're not sure if this is actually running, let's come back here and say, uh, what was it, docker container list. We can still see there that I've got my container running. Yeah, it's Clover Apache. Yeah, started 24 seconds ago. And now importantly, we've got it listening on a few different ports. In my case, it's listening on uh, the internal port in the container is port 80, but I've got port 8086 mapped to that. Yeah. Now, a couple of things, but first let's try and hit this in the browser and see what we get. Yeah. So let's come back out to my browser and it's going to be uh, localhost 8086. Is that right? Yeah. Hello from Docker. If you remember, that was what was in my, in here. And what this means is while I've got this running, you know, often if you do any web development, uh, especially with a remote server, it can be quite painful. You have to edit your files locally, FTP them up to the server, jump over to your browser, test them. You've made some stupid mistake, jump back down to your local version, edit it again, FTP it up to the server again, drives you mad. Yeah. But because we've got Apache running in a, um, in a container, and I've mapped a local folder into that. I can just make changes locally. Um, whatever stupid changes I want to make, save them and immediately come over and refresh my page. Yeah, so all my changes are, are available immediately. So that's kind of cool, I think. Uh, what else could we do? Here we go. You can tell I'm not... Uh, I'm not a Yeehaw web developer. Let's put some other text in here. Refresh. Yeah, we're away. Yeah, so in terms of shortening the development cycle, um, Docker, this is one of the big things that I use Docker for is shortening that developer cycle so that I don't have to muck around with FTP connections and remote servers and all that sort of business. I can edit my files locally. I can test them. But equally, I can test them in the production using the same system that production is going to use. Yeah? I don't have to run some pretend local web server and then hope that it behaves the same way under Apache. I can run Apache, the exact same version of Apache that we're going to run in production. Yeah? But I can run it in a container locally and do my development locally, have much higher confidence that it's going to work when I run it in the same Apache on the remote server. Yeah. Okay, but a couple more things, yeah. Um, so that's great, that's ports. And just to ram that home, that was the minus P command. Port 80 inside the container was mapped to port 8086 outside the container, yeah. But as is often the case with this, we've got a web server here, but um, let's say there's, a, there's an error inside Apache, something that I've configured incorrectly or whatever, I'm not getting any output here to see why it's failing. Yeah, so it's pretty common that I want to be able to look at the logs for the, um, for the process that's running inside the container. I could log into the container, I could get a, a, a shell into the container and go looking for it, but there's, there's another way that I can do it as well. The Docker um, command itself gives me a way to say docker container logs we need to give it the id of the container but that's just this guy here yeah so we can borrow that let me copy that docker container logs there's the id okay and i'll just do minus f so we can now see all of the um logs in real time from that um uh from that apache container 
Um, so as I interact with it through the browser or have my um, <clears throat> Apache module running and, and, and maybe throw exceptions or whatever else, I can have a terminal window open and see in real time the, the Apache log coming up. Okay, makes sense? So like I said, you could get an interactive session into your container and do that, but going through the Docker command itself is kind of nice because you can do this for any of them. If you're also in the background running a, a MySQL container, you can grab, jump in and have a look at the logs in that in real time as well. I think we're starting to get somewhere now. Um, probably the last bit that I want to talk about in terms of convincing you that Docker can be useful to you in your development, if I haven't already done that, um, is to talk about databases. Yeah, um, Especially when we're talking about Rad Studio and Delphi and CBuilder, a lot of the applications we're building are working with databases and potentially we have to support either multiple different databases like MySQL and SQL Server and, and Interbase and Oracle, or even if we don't have to do that, we very possible that we have to support multiple versions of databases. Yeah, two or three different versions. We might have customers running on two or three different versions of SQL Server, for example. Yeah. So again, leveraging containers to let us really easily switch, start up and switch between different databases um, is, is becomes really handy. So let's have a look at how we can do that. And along the way, we'll learn uh, another feature of Docker, which we can leverage for things beyond databases as well. So as I pointed out before, when we were looking at uh, Docker Hub, there's lots of different applications that have already been uh, set up in Docker images and available on Docker Hub. Uh, and as I pointed out at the time, one of those, um, one of those types of applications are databases. Um, so you can see here I'm looking at the MySQL um, official Docker images, but there's there's a bunch of them. If you want to play with uh, MongoDB, you'll find Mongo images available up here. If you want to play with Postgres, you know there'll be Postgres images up here. Um, lots of different databases. Yeah, uh, you want to do some. Um, I don't know what to search under, but there's probably even Windows and Linux um, Microsoft SQL Server images up here. Yeah, so a bunch of different images you can play with. Now these tend to be a little bit more complicated than just running up a, a Linux image, um, but they can be really useful. Um, very common, for example, in in you know if you're a Delphi developer um, and you're using FireDAC or whatever database library not uncommon that you need to test your application against multiple different versions of databases or even multiple types of databases. Maybe your application supports MySQL and also um, Microsoft SQL. Some of your customers are using one, some are using the other. So I guess you could maintain VMs with different versions of each of those available or for your development and testing you could just use um, Docker. Yeah, nice and simple. Um, and so that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to do a few different examples. We're going to have a look at a couple of different versions of MySQL. We'll also have a look at using Postgres as well. Yeah, but just to introduce you, partly to, to introduce you to the idea that um, one totally valid use for Docker in development is for running databases, um, but also to introduce you to a few more features of, of uh, Docker. Yeah, so let's have a look. Uh, let's say I want to use this MySQL um, image. Yeah, and like before, we can see the different versions that are available listed as tags. And if you go to the tags page, you'll be overwhelmed with the number of different versions that you can use. Um, we I'll probably just play with 5.7. Um, this this tag. Uh, and maybe also latest. Why don't we do one of both just so you can see that once you figure it out, um, what all of the different settings required are. Um, once you've got that figured out, it's really easy to switch between and test against different versions of the same database. Yeah. Now, we're going to use ports like we have in previous examples. We're also going to use volumes like we have in previous examples. But the additional feature of Docker that we're going to use are is the ability to override environment variables. Yeah. So if we have a look in this description of MySQL, if we scroll down a bit, 
um, you'll see, here we go, this Docker image has been set up with a number of environment variables. Yeah. So MySQL in this uh, Linux um, container is going to go looking for these named um, environment variables and use it for, um, for a different setting. So for example, it, it grabs its root password out of this MySQL underscore root underscore password environment variable. Um, uh, it uses this MySQL underscore database as the name of the database to be created on image startup. Yeah. Um, so for example, if we wanted to set the um, uh, startup MySQL, but have a particular value in the in the root password so that we can log into it. Well, we want some way to be able to set this environment variable. Yeah, from from outside from my Mac, I want to be able to start up a Linux container based on this MySQL image. But say this environment variable MySQL root password should have this value of Fred. Yep. So then when I go to log in as root, I can use the password of Fred and, and we're all happy. So let's have a look at how we might start up um, MySQL. Now the scenario I'm doing, like I mentioned before, is that um, I'm a developer on our app, on our Delphi application and we need to be able to test against a couple of different versions of MySQL and maybe also Postgres. Yeah. So I want to be able to start up this MySQL container and point it at my database files that my application is expecting. Yeah. If we have a look in my demos directory, I've got in here a folder called DB MySQL. Yep. And this is all I've really done is I've grabbed the secular DB, which is kind of like a fairly standard test database for MySQL. Yeah. And I've got the uh, schema, the dot SQL file for the schema, and I've got the dot SQL file for the actual data that I want loaded into it. Yeah. So when I start up this container, I also, in addition to telling it what the root password is, I also want to be able to tell it here, create this database, load up this example data so that when I connect to it, there's some meaningful data in it. Yeah. Well, again, the MySQL guys have thought of this. So if you scroll down the environment variable section, here we go, initializing a fresh instance. If you read through this, it basically tells you that if you um, put, when it starts up, it will look in this folder inside the container called docker entry point init db .d, yeah and any sql files that it finds in there will be executed on startup uh, of, of mysql yeah so as long as i put my my sql files in there and it's going to do them in alphabetical order so as long as i make sure that my sql file for creating the database structure is alphabetically earlier than my sql file for populating the data I should be able to have that created for me at startup. Yeah. So let's take a shot at this. I think we now know enough to be able to do this. So it'll be the same command as before. Docker container run. Yeah. Now I want to set a few of these environment variables. Yeah. The first one I want to set is that one that we looked at, which was this MySQL root password. Now I'm going to log in as root. I could use these MySQL user and MySQL password, but just for the purposes of the demo, let's use MySQL root password. Okay. So from the Docker command line, I can set environment variables yeah, using the minus E param. So I can say my uh, minus E, what's the password here? There, the, the environment variable, there it is. So MySQL underscore root password equals, and what do I want the root password to be? Yeah, I'll just make it root PW. Yeah, so that's the first one. Second one, I want it to create a, um, a database. Yeah, which is this one, this MySQL database um, environment variable. Name of a database to be created on image startup. Yeah, so let's do that one. So um, again, minus E, MySQL uh, database equals, and I'm just going to give it a name of Secula because that was the name of my imaginary applications database that I want to have created. Okay, so I've set the root password, I've told it to create a database. Awesome. 
Well, I'm going to be connecting remotely to it, so I still need to map its port, just like we did with the web server, yeah? So normally, um, MySQL, if, again, if you have a look through uh, this, the information in Docker Hub, you'll see that it's listening on port 3306, yeah? But that's the port inside the container. I want to map that to something on the outside on, of, of the container, yeah? So in my case, I'm going to map it to 3307, yeah? So my Mac OS port 3307 will effectively tunnel through or map through to the port 3306 on the container, yeah? What else? Well, it's created the database, but it hasn't populated it with structure or with data. And remember, that's where it goes looking for it in this Docker entry point init D file, yeah? So I want to basically map that so that inside the container, that directory maps out to this Secular DB folder, yeah? And we, we've already seen how to do that using volumes. Yeah, so I'll say minus V, just like before. Um, the uh, local uh, folder, yeah, which this, this Secular DB folder underneath, you know, DB MySQL Secular DB, yeah. So I'll say uh, whatever my product present working directory is, uh, PWD, okay, uh, DB MySQL Secular DB. Okay, that's the directory on my on my local machine on my on in this case on Mac OS. But what's the what should it appear as uh, inside the container? That should be mapped to this Docker entry point init db.d folder. Yeah. So that's that's what's going to be inside the container. So uh, that will map to Docker. I should probably just um, copy and paste this because no doubt I'll get it wrong. Uh, initdb.d. Yeah, I like to think that's right. Again, we're going to start this up um, just to show you a different way. I'm not going to start up an interactive session with this. I'm going to start it up just as a daemon, as we saw before. So minus d. Okay. And the last thing we need to say we haven't told it what image to use, what Docker image, yeah? So I'm just going to say MySQL and I'm going to use the 5.7 tag because I in particular want 5.7, okay? Now I know that looks like an awful lot, yeah? Like, that's nuts, as if you're going to remember that. I don't remember that. I copy it out of another file, yeah? But the point is, the first time you set this up, you'll have to read through the information on Docker Hub and all the rest of it. But once you've got it, you'll just stick this in a batch file or something like that, yeah? So you'll have locally a few batch files, start, you know, to test your application, start MySQL 5.7 bat, start MySQL latest dot bat, start Postgres, whatever, yeah? So you'll only really figure this out once and then stick it in a batch file, yeah? Or you'll have your continuous delivery tool like Jenkins or something start up, call, you know, run this command to start up the database before it runs your tests or something like that. So even though it looks nuts typing all this stuff in, you, you're not going to do it repeatedly. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, let's start this up. Now I started it up as a daemon. Remember I did minus D. So let's have a look. Docker container list. We can see it's running. Yep. Yeah, and it's listening on uh, 3307. Okay, so let's copy this ID, and just like before, I want to get, um, I want to have a look at its logs because I want to see that it's um, that it's done all of that stuff at startup. It created the directory, oh, sorry, created the database called Secular, ran my SQL scripts, and I want to see basically that it's ready to go. Now I can see one of the last messages here is that my SQL D is ready for connections, so that's good. But I can scroll back through here and go through and see what happened during startup. Yeah, uh, see whether it created my um, my database, uh, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so you can have a look back through the logs, and I'll leave this running actually, so that when I do some other stuff later on, we can see 
uh, the, these log files updating. Yeah, but it appears to me that my um, my SQL database is running. Yeah, so now I've just got a my SQL database running on the network. Yeah, so I can connect to it using FireDAC or whatever your favourite uh, Delphi data access technology is. Yeah, the one thing to realize, I don't know if I said this before, is that my container shares the IP address with the machine it's running on. So in this case, my container is running on my Mac. So it's going to use the IP address of my Mac. So if I want to reference this um, MySQL instance, it's listening on 3307, but the IP address is going to be the IP of my Mac. Yeah. So if I jump over to in VMware, I've got running uh, Delphi. Yeah. If I have a look at uh, in the data explorer, let's modify this connection and we'll just run through what I've got in here. Um, the server I've got set up as the IP address of my Mac, yeah, where the container is running, yeah, and the port is 3307, the one I told that I mapped in the command to run my Docker container, yeah. Uh, for MySQL, the root username is root, password is root pw, which is what I used the minus e environment variable to set, yeah. And the database name is Sekiller. I also used minus E, the environment variable, to set that. Yeah, So I should be able to test this and get a connection through to my database. Yeah, But then also, I should be able to come in here, see all of those Sekiller tables that were created. Uh, let's have a look at some of the data. If I view this, uh, that's not a terribly interesting table. Uh, let's have a look at customer. That might be a little bit more um, yeah, here we go. Here's some customer information running inside MySQL 5.7. Yep. So I'm just using Data Explorer here as a substitute for your application because Data Explorer, in this case, I'm using the FireDAC drivers. Equally, you could use your application's FireDAC drivers to connect. From your application point of view, it's just MySQL. It doesn't know that it's running in a container. Uh, it's just MySQL 5.7. Yeah. Now, on that, um, let's say, let me close this, okay, uh, let's say that I also need to test, I get, you know, we've been running against 5.7 for ages, we get a customer contact us and say that they're using our app, but they happen to be using it against the latest version of MySQL, yeah? Well, I could go and set up, a, install the latest version of MySQL on a machine somewhere, or spin up a machine in Amazon or, or start up a VM, create a VM or something like that. But that's a bit, you know, silly. Yeah, why don't I just start up a Docker container with with the latest version of MySQL, test it, and then when I'm finished with it, chuck it away. Yeah. Um, so uh, to do that, I should stop the one that I've already got. I actually don't have to, but, but let's be tidy. Uh, I didn't show you this before, but the way when you start a container uh, with minus D, um, you know, before when I was creating an interactive session when I wanted to to quit the container, I basically exited the binge the bash shell. Yeah. Well, I haven't created, I haven't started this one up running a bash shell. Yeah. I've started it up and it's running its own um, entry point, which is basically telling it to start my SQL. So instead, to kill it, I can use Docker container stop. And then I need to give the ID, the container ID, which is this guy. Yeah. So I'll do this. I won't hit enter just yet. When I hit enter, I'll jump across and we'll look at the logs. So because we should be able to see the logs, the shutdown details of the um, of MySQL. Yeah. So we can see it running through and shutting down. Um, there it was ready for connection, and then you can see where it received the shutdown message. Yeah. So you get to see it starting up and shutting down. But now I've got this problem customer that wants to wants to um, use my application with the latest version of MySQL. Well, now that we've done the hard work of figuring out how to start this, this is really easy. I just change 5.7 to latest. Yeah, done. Okay. Docker container list, just to make sure it's going. Grab the ID. Let's do uh, look at the logs just to make sure that it's finished setting up and it's ready for connections. Uh, plugin ready for connections. Here we go. MySQL D is ready for connections. Awesome. But it's version 8019 now. Yeah. Um, and away we go. We can come back in here, 
go to our MySQL driver, connect, run our application to test, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So this is one of the values of, to me, I, I don't care what sort of application you're writing, whether you, you know, you may not be writing a web app or, or something like that. Um, but even just using Docker as in development, where you need to spin up multiple databases, you need to spin up a, a web server, you need to be able to run tests in an environment where you know that the environment is exactly the same as it was last time you ran the tests. Yeah, there haven't been any changes or there's no leftovers from the last time you ran those tests. Yeah, or you want to um, test against multiple databases. Yeah, so let's kill this one. Uh, let's do docker container stop and give it the ID. Okay. Instead of MySQL, let's do Postgres. Yeah. Now you can come over to Docker Hub and you can read the, you can look up the Postgres um, image. Okay. Let's, uh, uh, let's have a look. Uh, where are we? So we're going to use this um, uh, official Postgres image. You can go through and you can look do look up those same things about, you know, this will be different to MySQL, how to start the instance, how to set the password and user and all that sort of stuff. I've already done that. Yeah. Um, so I'll show you the, the command docker container run just like before. Okay. Again, we're going to use environment variables because it also uses environment variables to set these things. Yeah. So let's do that. Uh, we're going to set the password different to MySQL, kind of the same idea, but different specific environment variables. But I'll set it to the same thing. So the, the password is going to be root password. Um, the database that I want it to use is going or that I want it to create I should say is going to be secular okay I'm going to I need to map the port again the port that um, Postgres sort of normally listens on is 5432 um, so I'm going to map that um, so it normally listens on 5432. That's what it's listening on inside the container. Outside the container, I can map that to something else. So far, I've been mapping it to something different. Like before, uh, MySQL was listening on 3306 and I was mapping it to 3307. You don't have to. Um, just to show you that you can use the same one, I'm going to map it to 5432. So all that means is port 5432 on my Mac, in this case, is going to map through to port 5432 on the container. Yeah. So you don't have to pick a different one. It's just that if you want to, or if you need to, because that port number is already being used by something else, then you've got that flexibility. Yeah. So I'm going to listen on port 5432. Uh, again, just like before, if we have a look over here, uh, initialization scripts it's going to be listening looking in the same directory actually that's nice they've got some consistency docker entry point init db.d it's going to look in there for any SQL files yeah kind of the same as what uh, my SQL did so I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to map my uh, local directory here db postgres I've got a similar database here called pagilla um, I've got the schema and then the data to insert so I'm going to map this using a volume uh, into that directory that it's looking for, that initDB directory, um, so that it'll create all the data for me. Yeah. Uh, where was I? Here we go. So minus V, um, my local file, my local directory, I should say, is hanging off the present working directory uh, under DB Postgres. Pegula uh, dash zero dot ten dot one and inside the container I want to mount that at docker entry point oops docker not dockers docker entry point 
a net db dot d okay so it'll go looking in that directory for any SQL files and find the ones that are in my shared volume awesome well, I want to start it as a daemon lastly what image do I want it to use I want it to use Postgres latest yeah let's see what my ID is docker containers list uh, not containers Okay, there's my ID. Let's just go and check. Look at the log. Make sure that it's ready to accept connections. There we go. Database system is ready to accept connections, but now it's Postgres. And again, I can jump over to FireDAC or in my application or whatever and test against that. So, you know, I don't care how um, how great you've got your VM set up. You know, these things start, Docker containers start and stop so quickly that to me, this beats having a VM hands down. You know, I've, I used to have a VM set up just to run, um, you know, this version of Innerbase or this version of MySQL and have another one for a different version and another one for a different type of database. And I'm loading up an entire copy of an operating system just to have a different version of a database. Yeah. Now, I can once I've done the hard work of figuring out the environment variables to set and the uh, the how to get the data loaded in, then I can just start and stop these things in seconds. Yeah, and again, the the memory overhead isn't that great because I'm not having a whole operating system loaded up just to run a database. Yeah, I'm leveraging the operating system of my host environment. Makes sense. Okay. Let's just shut it down, docker container stop. And again, we should see our Postgres messages on the way out. Cool. So we've been going for quite a while and hopefully by now you're starting to get your head around this, this docker thing and hopefully even starting to see how you might be able to use it. Um, but I'm quite kind of aware that so far none of the demos we've done have had really had anything to do with Delphi. Yeah, you can of course leverage it with Delphi, but we haven't done anything with Delphi. So it's about time we we brought Delphi into the mix. And so let's let's have a look at how we might start to use containers with Delphi. And I think what you'll see is that it's it's kind of no different. Yeah, the fact that we might be using Delphi a, a Delphi application inside these containers is kind of irrelevant. Yeah, um, it's just Docker. Now, when I've done this session previously, um, the next demo that I've done was to create a Docker file that set up um, a Linux image with all of the necessary um, dependencies uh, and everything needed to run Delphi Linux applications, yeah, uh, including PA server, so that you could deploy from within the um, within the IDE. Well. I want to do the same thing now, but in Barcadero I've made it really easy now. In the 10.3.3 release, they have also published some Docker images to make working with a few different parts of Delphi easier. So now rather than going through and showing you how to build a PA server Linux Docker image, um, I'm actually just going to show you how to use the ones that Embarcadero have published on Docker Hub. Yeah? So if we come over to Docker Hub and search for PA server, Um, we'll see a couple in here, but here's one called Red Studio PA Server. Yeah, and so these are the Embarcadero um, uh, images that they've created. Yeah, uh, and it goes in here and it tells you how to run the uh, the image. Yeah, uh, actually, let me go back. Um, there's actually, if we do a search for, if we click into Red Studio, we should see that there's three, actually three. Um, images currently that they've published on Docker Hub. These two uh, are RAD server Linux images. Yeah, one has uh, RAD server, um, all the RAD server uh, sort of dependencies um, and, and packages plus um, Apache uh, loaded up. Um, but it expects to connect to a remote Interbase database. If you're not aware, RAD server uses Interbase um, 
for its um, licensing and for its uh, users and those sorts of stuff. You don't have to use Innerbase for your data. You can connect to whatever you like. Um, but this one is a basically a Linux package, uh, a Linux image that has Apache with all of the RAD server necessary stuff. This is kind of the same, but it also includes Innerbase in that one image. Um, and then the third one that they've published is this PA server image. So it's nothing to do with RAD server. It's just Linux, all of the um, Delphi Linux dependencies um, plus PA server loaded up and ready to go. Now, if you've ever used the Delphi Linux support, I remember when it first came out and I was trying to set up a, a VM with a Linux image in it so that I could do some testing with it and play with it. Uh, I remember in the end I had to basically watch uh, Craig Chapman published about a one hour or a one hour plus video on how to set up Linux to support um, Delphi for Linux uh, binaries. Um, and so I was basically walking through watching that and pausing it and doing what he did. So it took this one hour video took two, probably around two hours or whatever to do to go up and set up this VM. Well, now you don't have to do any of that. Um, all you have to do is we'll copy this Docker uh, run command. I uh, better copy the whole thing. Um, and we'll come back out to the command line. We'll paste it in, but we'll go through and it needs us to put in a few values. But now, given what we've done, all of these things should make sense. Yeah. So there's a docker run command. This is actually old style. This will still work, but the new style is to say docker container run. Um, but docker run would have still worked. Uh, minus IT, so it's going to be interactive. Okay. Minus E, remember, we're overloading um, uh, environment variables. So this one is going to be the password that PA server expects. Uh, so I'll just set that to something super secret. Uh, minus P, so we're mapping some ports here. So PA server listens on, uh, inside the container, it's going to be listening on 64211. But we'll set it up to listen to something on the local machine, which I'll just make the same. Otherwise, I won't remember. Um, now, this image actually does something a little bit tricky, which we'll talk a bit more about in when I talk about GUI applications and Docker. Uh, but basically, they've set up uh, um, this Broadway D server so that you can you can actually use this for a GUI Linux application and access the user interface through a web browser. Yeah. So I don't want to go too much into Broadway D. I know I think either Marco or Jim did a a video around the 10.3.3 launch on how to use Broadway D um, to use a browser to interact with your um, Delphi Linux GUI applications. Yeah, um, but for now, basically, I'll just tell it that I'll I'll map that to port 8082, and then lastly, the name of the image that we're going to run is Red Studio slash PA Server, and in this case, it's the 10.3.3 version. Yeah. So if I run that, okay, PA server starts up. I can uh, uh, do the commands to see what um, what uh, uh, things are available to me. Yeah, but now that's it. I don't have to go in and and configure a Linux VM and do all of that stuff that Craig spent an hour doing in his his video. If I now just come into the IDE and uh, I'll just I'll do something not terribly interesting because I just want to show it's more about the, the Docker part than the actual Delphi part. Um, but I've just created a um, console application. I'll just do a right line. Um, I don't know. Hello from Delphi in a Docker container. Woohoo. Could have done hello world, but whatever. Um, this is currently set up as a target platform of Windows. Let me add Linux, uh, Linux 64-bit. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, it's already stood up. If you have a look, it's already found my Linux Docker profile. Um, but if I have a look at that, just to show you what it's set up to do. Uh, Linux Docker set up Linux 64-bit. Host name is just the IP address of my Mac 
uh, my MacBook. Yeah, because remember, my my Docker container is running on my MacBook, and it shares the IP address of whatever it's running on. Um, its port number is six four two one one, which was the port that I um, mapped it to. I'll just make sure that the password is right. Fubar super secret. Test the connection. Awesome. It can see PA server. Um, so we'll just save that. And now, well, it's kind of boring. It's so easy. You just can run it. F9 it. Uh, if we jump back out here, we should be able to see hello from Delphi in a Docker container. Now, granted, that's not super exciting. The point is, it's not exciting. It's boring. That's great. Last time I tried to do this from scratch with a VM, it was anything but boring. It was, if I had hair, I'd be tearing it out. Yeah. This, this being boring is a good thing, trust me. Um, you can find excitement in lots of other places. You don't look for excitement in, in, uh, in trying to deploy your application to Linux. Yeah. All right, we're on the downhill slope now. You've been hanging in for a long time. Uh, so let's wrap this session up. Um, I did say it was a practical session, so we've done the bulk of the, uh, the content. There's just a few topics I want to talk about right there at the end. The first off um, is, I get it, I, all the demos that I've done so far have been Linux, right? This audience uh, on this webinar are probably predominantly coming from a, a Windows background, given the heritage of Rad Studio and Delphi and C Builder. So what about Windows? Um, the good news is that um, because Docker, as I mentioned before, Docker came out, containers already existed, Docker came out and really massively made the developer experience around containers much easier. Yeah. Uh, and so once they, you know, Microsoft could see the, the writing on the wall, basically, where Docker, you know, was was the dominant way to to interact with containers. And so when they were implementing their container support on both, um, which they did in, in Windows Server 2016 from that version onwards, and also Windows 10 anniversary update that version onwards. If you've got either of those platforms or later, you'll have Windows container support. But the nice thing is when they built it, they built it so that all of the commands were compatible with Docker. So if you're on Windows and you want to start up a Windows container instead of a Linux container, Surprise, surprise, what you do is docker container run minus IT, it's all exactly the same, yeah? So the, the, the API is probably the wrong word, but the, the interface that you interact with, with Windows containers, is compatible with, with Docker, yeah? So that's the good news, okay? The bad news is the containers themselves, the images themselves are not compatible, yeah? Which kind of kind of makes sense. The Linux images that we've been creating so far are full of Linux binaries and Linux file systems and, and those sorts of things. That's not going to work on Windows. Yeah. So when you create a Windows image, um, you use a Docker file the same way and the syntax is the same. You have from and the name of the base image and all that kind of stuff. But instead of doing Linux configuration stuff and copying in Linux binaries and that sort of thing inside your Docker files, you'll be doing Windows type stuff. Yeah. Um, so to me, this, I mean, this is fine. Um, the commands are compatible. That's the hard bit. My, I don't have to suddenly switch and go, okay, I'm using Docker on Windows now. What's the command to start a container? It's exactly the same. Yeah. The fact that the containers themselves are not compatible in my view, isn't a big deal. Okay. Um, the other thing you'll notice if you go on to um, Docker Hub, as we saw before, Docker Hub lists both Linux containers and Windows containers. The Windows containers are bigger, um, mostly due to the fact that Windows itself is bigger than, than Linux. Um, so whereas Linux containers are often in the tens or the hundreds of megabytes, Sorry, I should say Linux images. Linux images are often in the tens or hundreds of megabytes. Um, it's not uncommon for a Windows um, image, container image, to be in the gigabytes. Yeah. Um, this has improved, though, as Microsoft have launched things like Windows Nano Server and those sorts of things, which have massively trimmed down bare bones versions of Windows. Um, the size of these Windows containers are coming down. Yeah, so it's getting better, but it, but you know, the reality is they are, they are bigger. Okay. 
The follow-on question from that usually is about GUI applications, um, both on Linux and on Windows. Probably the most common question I get from people is once they understand Docker is awesome, how can I put my VCL GUI application into a Windows container? Yeah. Um, there's two answers to this. There's the official what is supported answer, and there's the what can I probably get to work answer. Yeah. So the official answer is no doesn't support GUI applications. You'll notice that all of the applications I've done so far in this session have been either command line applications or they've been servers and services. Yeah. So officially, no. Unofficially, if you Google, you know, Linux, um, Docker, GUI apps or, or Windows container, Docker, GUI apps, you'll find all sorts of different um, I don't want to say hacks because some of them are actually quite elegant, but all sorts of various approaches to getting GUI apps to work. Yeah. Um, the um, so so it is kind of possible. What I've found is most of the approaches are not really production worthy uh, to me. You know, I wouldn't roll out one of these things into production. Uh, however, it can be really helpful in development. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, the, the, when we were looking at the um, Embarcadero uh, PA server Linux image before, when we were setting that up, I mentioned that this is the port. I made some throwaway comment about this is the port for Broadway D. Yeah. Um, well, Embarcadero have included one of these approaches to get GUI apps to work inside their PA server um, image. Yeah. And so if you've got a Linux GUI application in Delphi and you go to run it, you can you know, deploy it the way that I showed you. But then if you specify that Broadway D server, what Broadway D lets you do is access the user interface of that application through a web browser. Yep. So whatever port you specified for Broadway D, if you go and hit that in your web browser, you'll up will come your GUI of your application in the browser. Super cool. And, and in fact, one of the smoothest experiences I've seen. If you try some of these other hacks for getting Linux or Windows GUI apps to work through Docker, um, you'll be going through all sorts of um, uh, steps to get it to work. This The Embarcadero approach with Broadway D is just remarkably simple. Um, I think either Marco or Jim have done a, a um, video of that, so we'll we'll stick the link of that into the into the notes for the uh, the webinar. So. If this is about development, great. Have a look at some of these these approaches. I mean, the Broadway D one's pretty good for Linux. The for Windows, there are various approaches you've got. Um, if this is about production, though, I personally would still be quite nervous about rolling this out. Yeah. If you really want to to leverage this type of container approach for um, for a production um, Windows GUI app, I'd be more inclined to look at app virtualization, which gives you a lot of the same benefits, but it's been designed for GUI applications. Yeah. The other question that I'm just going to touch on, but just because I want you to be aware of it, is, is this topic of multiple containers. Um, all of the examples so far, we've been starting up one container, using it, stopping one container. But we've kind of hinted at the fact that you might have the situation, say, with a web application, where you've got your web server in one container and you've got your um, database in another container. Yeah. Well, what we've done so far is fine. We can start up the database container, and once that's running, we can start up the web container, and provided they know about each other's ports, we're good to go. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that Docker has much more extensive networking support than we've mentioned, so you can actually define private networks between your containers so that they're not sharing the general network with the host operating system. Yeah, But it's possible. You can start up multiple containers, but the more complex it gets, the more dependencies between them. Containers have got to get started in certain orders. You know, Your database has got to be running before your web app, uh, your web server container starts, or maybe you want multiple web server containers all load balanced back to your database. Once these rules start getting a bit more complicated, um, it can get a bit beyond what you can kind of easily manage just by issuing commands. Yeah. Um, so there is, um, if you go and have a look at Docker, there is another 
feature of it called Docker Compose, and this is defined. This is designed to solve this exact problem. So after you've done everything we've just done, where you've got your images and you've got your commands, where you, you're starting all these containers individually, you can then go and create a Docker Compose file that lets you define the relationships between multiple images and how and multiple containers. Yep. So you can um, say. Um, here's my container and I want three, I want to start up three copies of that and here's my database and it needs to start first and be available before these other ones start. And then once you've defined that in your compose file, it then becomes really easy. You can just with a single command say start up that, that configuration and shut down that configuration. Yeah. So if you do get further into having these multiple um, uh, applications using multiple containers. It's worth having a look at Docker Compose. It's relatively simple and straightforward um, and, and quite powerful. Yeah. Which is, brings us to this thing called Kubernetes, which is the last thing I want to talk about. Um, Kubernetes is also powerful, but it's anything but simple. Um, so you've possibly heard of Kubernetes. Uh, even if you haven't known what it was, it's kind of hard to to avoid the word Kubernetes in our industry at the moment. So what, what's this Kubernetes thing? Well, Kubernetes is trying to solve exactly the same problem as Docker Compose. Yep. So it, it uses containers. It'll use Docker containers, no problem. Um, but it's trying to solve this problem of um, what do I, how do I manage um, applications that are made up of multiple containers and where the relationships between those containers are complex. Yeah. Um, they refer to it as container orchestration, and that's kind of what it is. You, you, it's this tool that manages when containers start, when they stop, where they're running, which machines they're on, um, under what situations should we start more copies, in what situations should we scale down and, and reduce the number of copies of containers, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, like I said before, you can define things like my application consists of three copies of a web container and the DB. Uh, if the DB container crashes, I want you to start it again. Um, if the CPU usage on my web containers goes above 80%, I want you to start up a fourth one. Equally, if it drops for a period of time, I want you to shut one down, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you can define all of those rules and then Kubernetes will, will take care of running it for you. Yeah. Now... I don't know that I want to say too much more about Kubernetes because it is super powerful, um, very complex. Yeah. So don't just be aware that this is what it does. Okay. Um, it also, we, we're starting to leverage it more for cloud independence because pretty much all of the cloud vendors, Amazon, Azure, Google, DigitalOcean, all of these guys offer Kubernetes, managed Kubernetes um, systems. Um, Rather than saying, well, we're going to go Amazon and, and binding yourself to all of the Amazon APIs, if you are careful and if you only write to sort of the Kubernetes uh, APIs, you can move your application between Amazon and Azure and whatever else because um, you're, you're only relying on Kubernetes. Yeah, you don't get that for free. It takes a lot of um, thought and testing but it is possible to be able to move between these platforms yeah but my recommendation right now is don't worry about that okay start with docker in your development uh, environment hopefully you've already seen a a value that you can get out of it today um and if that's all you ever use it for, you know, maybe it's spinning up different databases and different versions so you can do testing. If that's all you ever use it for, awesome. You've already won. You've got a benefit. Great. Move on with your life. <clears throat> um, if you're interested or if you want to go deeper or you see, a, see value in going deeper, then get further into it. Worry about, you know, maybe Docker Compose first before you even tackle Kubernetes. Yeah. Kubernetes is a bit of a beast super powerful but um yeah it's a lot to t wrap your head around okay um just to highlight the benefits in case uh, it hasn't been clear one of the big benefits is that your dev environment is basically the same as your deployment environment if you're taking this all the way through to production the image uh, that you used in development can be and probably should be the same image that you deploy into production yeah so then that re reduces the opportunity for those it works on my machine moments. Yeah. 
Um, it can massively simplify testing because you know that every time your tests run, you've spun up a new container and the tests, it's in the same state as it was last time the tests ran. So if, if before the tests worked and this time they fail, you know it's not because of a configuration on the machine. Yeah, because the machine is, it, it, it's exactly the same as it was before. The container is exactly the same as it was before. So you can be pretty confident it's something in your application. Yeah. Um, I love one of my favorite things about it is the fact that I'm defining the infrastructure for my application, the operating system and the dependencies and the databases it needs and the message queues and whatever else it needs. I'm defining that in my Docker file yeah, as text. And that text is versioned with my source code of my application. Yeah. And it can change with it. If I'm adding a new feature to my application that requires a new dependency, when I'm checking my code into the repository, I've also changed my Docker file for have that new dependency and I check in it as well. So if I then roll back to some previous version, I'm also at the same time rolling back my infrastructure. How awesome is that? Imagine trying to check your VM into version control and roll back to an earlier VM out of Git or something. That's nuts. Yeah. This, it's just a text file, so it's fine. You roll back, it'll you can regenerate that image or you might even have the image in in your uh, in your um, image repository or whatever, but you can roll back both your application and the infrastructure that it depends on. Magic. Okay, that's pretty much what I just said. Okay, and then to summarize. Okay, hopefully I've shown you that Docker is not just for hipster web developers. Yeah, that even if you're doing whatever you're doing, uh, uh, client server development doesn't matter. Docker, there's a value there for you that you can get from it, even if it's just in development. It's not, hopefully I've also shown you it's not that hard to get started. You don't have to go and tackle Kubernetes and all this other stuff. You don't even, to be honest, I got started with Docker before I'd even read a book. I've since read some Docker books. But when I got started, all I did was install it and start fumbling around and did a bit of Googling until I could figure out how to spin up a, a Linux container. Yeah, and you can go from there. So hopefully in this webinar, I've given you that sort of kickstart so that you can get going, okay? Thank you. This is a long webinar. So I, I really appreciate you guys who have stuck out to the end. I really appreciate it. Um, come back and watch the replay where you need to. Um, but otherwise, I hope this has been of value to you. Um, my contact details were at the beginning. So if there's any questions or whatever, um, that you think about later on, please reach out and and uh, um, and and ask. Happy to uh, happy to have a conversation about it. Otherwise, I think we're going to go and do some uh, Q and A right now. So thank you guys. Cheers. Okay, Fan Oops. fantastic. Thank you, Malcolm, for that, and thank you everybody for sticking around. A lot of lot of great content here. Yeah, I'm actually super impressed how many people are still here. Um, if I wasn't presenting, I wouldn't be still here after this length of time. I would have definitely needed a bathroom <laughs> break. So, man, you guys are impressive. Well, and, you know, I was telling you this, and uh, when I, the Docker is something that I was, I knew was big, and everybody was always talking about, and it was, seemed really exciting. And it was something I knew I wanted to learn about, but I just never found any good sources for how to understand it because everybody talks about it in a context that just didn't make sense to me and then once i and I, i've watched videos and uh, followed tutorials and I even attended live sessions and just never really felt like i understood it and then once i you had i saw your session in, in at adug i was like okay now i get it now this makes sense so yeah that's great and i i am a big fan of the idea that Really what it's all about is getting somebody enough information to, so they are comfortable getting started, going out and making some mistakes, and then uh, going from there and figuring things out. So, Well, that, I mean, that's good to hear because that's what I was aiming at. I mean, I, I, I did the same thing. I, I saw various Docker sessions, um, and they always seemed to like fly past the bit that I was, the basics that I was really interested in and get straight into all of the more super advanced stuff which i guess if you're using docker day in day out is fine that's what you want to see um but it kind of skipped all the basic stuff of well how do i map a volume and and how do i you know how do i get a console in 
so that's kind of what I want to focus wanted to focus on. Um, you know, and I figured, you know, everyone on the webinar, they're smart people. So once once they know the basics, they'll be able to work out the, the other bits that matter to them. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So um, let me pull up the ask uh, show screen um, here. The uh, one of the things that crazily I realised I didn't put into the session uh, was a link to download it. So I've actually put a link in the chat window. Um, oh great! Oh great! Thank you. You had to include uh, include photos. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the things I included in the chat window is uh, a link to actually download um, Docker. Uh, the easiest way to get it on Mac or Windows is this thing called Docker Desktop, and that'll give you a uh, like a like a menu that you can run inside Windows or Mac that lets you start Docker and all that sort of stuff. So to me, like I, I just use that as well. It's it's easy. I, it, it updates itself. So I know I've always got a fairly recent version of Docker. So yeah, if you want to get start playing with it, that's probably the easiest way. Okay, great. Uh, so I did want to show the slide here because some other exciting news. We just recently had the uh, Code Rage end of year roundup and I'll put this link in here. And uh, Malcolm was recognized as the MVP of the year for Asia Pacific. So congratulations, <laughs> Malcolm. Thank you for, and this is why, because you have this fantastic content and you do such a great job explaining something that's really important and really valuable. So. Uh, well, well, thank you. Um, I'm still waiting for the check to arrive in the mail. Like a, that must have been held up. Is there some? Uh... <laughs> uh, not, not that I've heard of. If you do get a check, oh, let me know, though, because I, I would be interested to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I appreciate that. It's uh, cool. Yeah. Well, and, and also, you know, I, I suck up so much information from other people um, online that it feels only right that I should give some back. So here is the Docker desktop uh, for Windows and Mac, uh, the link that Malcolm put in the chat there. And then you alluded to the uh, introduction or the Broadway FireMonkey for Linux. That was actually covered in this webinar here, which is the introduction to FMX Linux. And I had thought I had split this apart into multiple videos because it covers a lot in here. So that's not done yet. I'll have to look at getting that done so that you can go in and find uh, the uh, this piece you want. But the uh, Broadway is towards the end. It's covered. And also Broadway is covered some more in the videos that will be coming here in the near future on uh, using uh, Docker more with uh, Rad Server and stay tuned for that. You should all get emails to that uh, with the replay link for this webinar. If not, you can find it on uh, community.embarkardera.com slash developer tools or on our YouTube channel in the future. And yeah, that's it. So let me go ahead and jump in here to questions. Uh, you answered a lot of questions as we went along. But uh, was there anything you wanted to add that you already covered? Otherwise, we'll jump into some of the new questions here. Uh, it was so long. I'm trying to remember the questions that I answered right at the beginning. Um, uh, wow. Do we? Hmm. Uh, uh, the the they covered a pretty wide um, a, a wide scope, um, and and a lot of them were the the normal situation where the, the question at the beginning was covered, you know, three quarters of the way through. Um, so uh, uh, well, actually one that came up quite a, a couple of times was around databases. Um, and and someone, and I apologize, I can't remember who, who it was, but they made the really valid and, and good point that, that Docker um, in production should really be about stateless applications. And so that maybe raises a question mark about, um, do you, should you stick a database server in there? Because that's kind of the definition of stateful. Um, and so the, the the point there is that, you know, for development, which is what I was primarily talking about here, being able to spin up different databases in containers is is awesome and, and really fast and, and really productive. Um, as soon as you go into production, you you might want to think twice about running your production database in a in a container. And the reason for this is that one of the benefits of a container in production, like I talked about when I got into Docker Compose and and then Kubernetes, one of the the points of that is that if if your container crashes, 
you can have a system set up to automatically restart it somewhere else. But obviously, if it's um, if if it's a stateful application, then then you've got some complications to deal with there. So if you look out in the on the in the wild in the internet, you you'll see a lot of people saying don't use databases in in containers. A you can have that argument, but B really that's about production in development. Totally fine. Yeah, there's no issue, uh, and and the only issue in production is because containers can kind of come and or should be able to come and go and get restarted and, and start multiple copies and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it you know it in development the being able to have it in a, a Docker container because that's it, it really I think it, the testing right the reproducibility of the testing that kind of is a stateless thing is you need to have a way to get to the state you want quickly and easily. And that's something Docker is just perfect for. Yeah, and and in development, you're in control of when this container begins and ends, and so you can you can sort that out. It's just in production where you might have an automated system starting and stopping containers and restarting them and those sorts of things. Things can get a bit complicated. But honestly, uh, the other thing that I see with Docker, a lot of people, you know, yeah, you can run hugely scalable systems in in Docker and by extension Kubernetes. Um, it's magic for that, but but equally, I see people building applications and deploying them onto Kubernetes that don't need Kubernetes. You know, they're yeah. they're equipped to scale to the point of you know Google, um, but they've got an application which is servicing a few thousand people. So so a lot of those things are actually overkill, um, and so even you know there's value to be had. I wouldn't ignore the value just in Docker, even in production without Kubernetes and without these other things. Um, if you want to use containers in production in the cloud, but you're a bit scared off by Kubernetes or it's unnecessary complexity, there's an awesome middle ground like Amazon and Azure and, and possibly Google, I don't know, but certainly Amazon and Azure both have managed container services systems where you can basically point them at your Docker container and say, right, I want two copies of that running and three copies of this other image running. You sort out the details and it just takes care of it for you. Um, and so you don't have to swallow all of that complexity of Kubernetes. Yeah. And I suspect like for a lot of the Delphi systems that that I've worked with people on, that level of, of scalability would be heaps more than more than you need. Yeah. So you know, lots of people like to overcomplicate things, but but really, it, it some of these simple sy systems are, are enough. Yeah, it, it it it's one of those things that sometimes I think we get excited about technology and we want to use it as a work. That's always the trick is is not over implementing. I, I call that uh, the curse of the programmer, especially when it comes to you want to make everything a reusable library or component. Sure. <laughs> it, it doesn't need to be; it just needs to get the job done. Later, yeah. you can decide to be a. Yeah, and I and I do that all the time. So I'm poking, you know, I'm throwing rocks at myself, really. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, the the only reason, like, I I love Kubernetes. I think it's truly awesome, but it is seriously a beast. And most systems that I've seen people use Kubernetes for don't need it. Yeah. Right. If you do need it, it rocks. But if you think you need it, go for a good long walk and, and consider it because you probably don't. Yep. And, and then once you use it, then you have to, your, uh, it bring, brings a bit of overhead with it, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A bit. Uh, let's see. A lot of very positive feedback here. Someone said this is the best webinar we've ever had. Definitely. Wow. definitely I'm, I'm going to stick that on my email signature now. That's just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how are security updates on the Docker OS base handled? That's a really good question. So once you've, if I've made a um, a Docker image that I've customized and I've added the things I need to add to it, and then the base OS has a, a major security update come in, how does mm -hmm. how does that get applied to my Docker container? Yeah, well, it, I mean, it doesn't happen automatically. You you are still responsible for for applying it. So for example, if I've, you know, the examples we did, like let's say I'm using MySQL and I'm using that in production, uh, like I did during the demos, if if tomorrow there's a fix that comes out for, for MySQL or for one of the, you know, the SSL libraries or whatever it is that, that I'm depending on, 
um, it's down to me to to update that. Well, unless I'm using a a um, like the the MySQL image, you know, it could be the case that MySQL update their their images to take in that fix, and then I can just rebuild my image, and away we go. Um, That's what I was going to ask. Is if... Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You, you I was going to say so, so. If if I build on top of uh, the official uh, Ubuntu MySQL image and uh, and I'm using that and then there's an update that's applied to that the image I've built on top of how do I get that or do I need to what's the process there yeah so so if you, you it's possibly didn't notice but when when I started up uh, like the Apache one that I hadn't already had downloaded uh, it, you saw it pulled down about five or six other images. So they were all of the kind of the images, the ancestor images for want of a better word that, that it was using. Um, so if one of those updates, in theory, you can just pull down that image, but I generally find it safer just to rebuild my image and it'll go off and check and pull down any new versions that, that are necessary. Um, so rebuilding your images, redeploy them, away you go. And so I don't manually do that generally. I have like Jenkins or some CD tool that that is responsible for doing that. And so as part of building my application, um, it would grab the latest images and, and rebuild and deploy. Yeah. So so A, I guess there's a few answers. A, you're still actually responsible for, for watching that. But B, if you're depending on the, the images you're using, you might be able to pick it up from someone uh, upstream. Um, the other thing is that even if you're not, even if you're using an image that you actually have to go and patch, um, you might have five other applications internally that are all leveraging that image. So you've got one place to patch it now. Whereas if you had VMs running around the place or a bunch of bare metal machines uh, that, that were all needed this patch, you've got potentially dozens of places you need to go and apply that patch. But if you're leveraging Docker, one of the ancestor images needs an update. The the CD tool can rebuild the others to to pick it up, and and away you go. You know you've got one place to touch. You know, so it kind of gives you that. In some ways, it gives you inheritance of infrastructure, just like we've got inheritance in our source code with classes. Um, you know, my 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 infrastructure, like I talked about in the webinar, is now source code essentially. It's my Docker file. Um, and so, and I've got inheritance through the the layered images, um, and so I get a lot of those same benefits of making a change in one place and having that propagate down to multiple containers that leverage it. So Rob's asking, would Docker containers be an alternative to old school CRUT, C H R O O T, uh, multiple da multiple daemons? Uh, well, maybe if I understood what CRUT multiple demons was, <laughs> I, I'm generally with these questions. I'm generally pretty old school, but I, I actually don't know what that means. Uh, so so I, I, I'm I don't know. Slightly familiar with CRUT. I don't know. Oh, I see. I'm just reading it and getting in real time, uh, up to date, real time. <laughs> Okay, so it's kind of, if I understand it, it's kind of like uh, a bit like in Python where you can create multiple ENVs, uh, multiple environments, and they're kind of semi-isolated from each other. If if my extensive experience with CRUT is is anything to go by. <laughs> um, so maybe, I don't know, that's a terrible answer, isn't it? Don't know is what I would be saying. <laughs> so I think that the, the comment you made about the there's a few questions here about it looks like deployment things and i think that that's an important situation is, is that your your um typically your containers the idea behind them is they are stateless because they spin up and spin down as needed uh, and once they spin down that they're lost so they go back to that starting state that they were at uh yeah. so rob rob extended or expanded on this here it says uh see NH root is a R restricting the file system to allow different config files for each instance. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, possibly. I mean, based based on that, it sounds like you know, yeah, you can definitely do that in 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 leveraging Docker. Um, there's possibly, very possibly, some subtleties of CRUT that I'm not um, uh, 
or ch root or whatever you meant to say that i'm not appreciating but yeah maybe so you, we use docker in production but the idea of having the docker images maintain the state is not is what we should avoid right well well you need to be aware that um you know if if you're starting if you're starting a docker container um, and you just you're managing it, then it's fine. It's no more likely to crash than if you were starting a VM and managing it yourself. You know they're not inherently more unstable or anything. Yeah. Um, the, the the complexity around statelessness comes in when you're using something like Kubernetes or some other orchestration system um, to to take to manage it for you. Yeah, some automated management system where it'll start the containers and move them around and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's where your complexity for statelessness comes in. But if you've just got a, a VM running on or a, a, a box running in your data center and you start up a Docker container on it, well, that's not really any different from installing MySQL on a machine and running it. You know, that's just as likely to or or as unlikely to crash. Yep. Uh any example compiling SAPI for Apache and run it on Docker Ubuntu? So it would be yeah. it would be a uh, not via a SAPI. A SAPIs are for iOS. Yeah, but an Apache module. Yes, there is actually. It's one of the things I trimmed out of this webinar. It was going to be even longer, <laughs> so I, I left that one out. I did that demo at the ADUG session, and I didn't do it here. So what I might do is uh, record that one just as a little ten or fifteen minute thing, and stick it up as well um uh and uh just just for that little it'll be like the director's cut or something like that well it, you know we could certainly have what let me i just pull up here i have it looks like four or five videos that i was just editing that are going to be uh you should get a link to or it will also be on our youtube channel and i'll link to them on the replay page there is one on uh i don't see what their individual cover is but i think we do have uh, showing how to do they, they more focus specifically on um rad server and I, excuse me i think also apache modules but i'm not sure but yeah it would be great if you do add that as well i think the other ones are all rad server specifically so yeah yeah i've got one just where i do a web broker apache module and set up a uh set up a docker file so that i can easily just spin up a, a an instance and and point it and have my um, apache module in a um in a shared volume and, and it just picks it up um so like i say i'll i'll, uh, I'll recover from my early, early morning this morning and then I'll, I'll try and record it what time is it for you now oh right now it's very civilized it's 7 30 in the morning but where, uh, when i got up it was 4 30 so that's a little yeah. before my, my usual uh, get up time uh, let's see a couple of the questions here. Uh, today we use Elastic Beanstalk Apache for our uh, modules on Linux. We use PHP as a starting point and modify with script. Should we consider moving to a Docker? Uh, not if it's working and there's no problems. I'm a big believer if something's working and and uh, and there's no urgency for change, then I wouldn't. Um, Unless you know, uh, un unless there's something about that which is causing you grief in terms of you know one one difference there might be around um, you know your developer experience being different to your production experience. So that might be one thing where Docker could uh, could help you. Um, but you know even there you could possibly use Docker Apache in development and then deploy to to um, Beanstalk uh, uh, Apache on Beanstalk. Um, so, you know, if it's working and, and there's no specific problem, then great. If there is a specific problem, probably depends what the problem is. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, with all of this stuff, play with it first in development. Um, tackling it for um, production is a is a, another two hour, two hour webinar on top of this. Maybe not, but it's another discussion on top of, uh, on top of the development stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Test it out, get your feet wet, Start using it in production and then figure out how to use it. And then, uh, yeah, figure out all the sharp edges I didn't tell you about, all that sort of stuff. So, I always say that until you you break something and have to figure out how to fix it, you don't really aren't, haven't really started to understand it yet. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. I, I often go out of my way to break something just so I can, the process of fixing it teaches me way more. Yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, well, thank you everybody for sticking around. There's still quite a few of you here. It's great to see some of you show up for this webinar and uh, everything. Uh, Malcolm, I will get a copy of your slides from you and that, if you yes. want to do that short video, and I will uh, put up a blog post with a replay. And, uh... Awesome. Yep. Uh, I'll get you those slides, no problem. Great. All right. And once again, congratulations on uh, MVP of the year for uh, Asia Pacific region and for all that you do as an MVP. And, uh, and so. thank you. Uh, very, uh, very humbled. There you go. I, I need to have an Oscar acceptance speech or something like that. Didn't, didn't know you were nominated, so probably it was hard. Well, and as I was telling you before, I didn't know I'd, uh, I'd I'd won anything until I started getting these cryptic messages congratulating me. And I was kind of, sorry, what have I done? What am I being congratulated <laughs> for? Because I think the webinar was at like two in the morning or something for yeah. me. So, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't on it. <laughs> I had a few, uh, it, you know, it's always interesting for me because I'll like go on social media and I follow, I you know, most all the MVPs on Twitter or whatever if they're on. And I'll see one of my slides pop up with somebody's picture next to it. They're like, oh, so-and-so just sent me this. Apparently I won this, you know, happy to, happy <laughs> to accept this, you know, because it was middle of the night for them or, or they, or whatever the case was. And so for me, it's like, wait, I made that slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, welcome everybody. You're, you're welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we will see you all online next time. I guess the next webinar we have coming up is Interbase 2020, what's new? And then after that, we have the uh, Delphi's 25th birthday webinar. coming. And I'm sure there's other ones. Those are the ones on my top of my mind right now. So stay tuned for those. Make sure you get registered and we'll see you all then. Take care, everybody. And we'll talk to you later. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Bye. -bye.